Hello and welcome to Psych Boost. In this video, we'll be looking at Rusbutt's investment model as our next theory of romantic relationships. We'll need to define what investment theory is, and we'll use the key terms commitment, satisfaction, alternatives, investment size, and we'll categorise investment as intrinsic and extrinsic. Of course, as usual, we'll give you some evaluative research to use in an essay and some examples of where we can extend our evaluation. So first up, what is investment theory? Well, investment theory, again, similar to equity theory, is a development of social exchange theory. Investment model theorists would suggest that if we decide to continue a relationship, we don't just consider our current level of satisfaction, our current level of costs and rewards. We do have to think, of course, about alternate relationships, as we've discussed in previous videos, but also we need to consider how much has already been invested into that relationship. So for investment theorists, our formula about whether a relationship will continue is as follows. Commitment, so whether you decide to stay or leave, is equal to your satisfaction level, the same as social exchange theory, minus the alternatives that are around. So any alternatives will reduce your commitment, but plus investment. So what do we mean by investment? Well, investment size, being distinguished from costs and rewards, is those things that are in a relationship that can't really be recovered in a breakup, or maybe if it can be recovered in a breakup, would be difficult to divide or might not be the same afterwards. So what do I mean by this? Well, it might be helpful to break it down to two categories of investment. We have intrinsic investments. So these are things that you as an individual have put directly into the relationship as you've been trying to make it work. So you've been investing emotionally. You've spent time with this person trying to develop your relationship and you've also self-disclosed to them. So when you leave, you're never gonna get that time back that you spent investing in the relationship. And you're not gonna be able to take those self-disclosures back either. That person's always gonna know those things about you. There are also extrinsic investments. So these are things that maybe started off outside the relationship, but started to become strongly connected to that relationship. So maybe you've developed some mutual friends. Maybe you've built strong memories from holidays you've bought together. Maybe you've bought possessions, maybe you have a house. And certain activities, events, so maybe you listen to a certain band together, and now that song that you used to enjoy is now intimately connected to your relationship with that person. And you can see that end in the relationship will fundamentally change a lot of these intrinsic and extrinsic investments. Now these investments, they might be rewarding and they might be costly. So a shared friendship would be rewarding and investing money on date nights would have been costly. So they are similar to rewards and costs, but keep in mind that investments can't be removed. For example, if you used to enjoy going to Zumba on a Wednesday night, but now Wednesday night is date night, you might see future Wednesday nights as giving those up as a cost, but you're never going to get back all the Wednesday nights that you were going to Zumba, but you've given them up to invest in relationship. Those Wednesday nights are invested. Maybe you've been paying extra towards the household bills because maybe you earn more than your partner. You're never going to get that money back that you've invested in the bills, but you might see ongoing costs as something that can be recovered. So keeping in mind what commitment is. Commitment is whether you're gonna stay or leave a relationship. And we would argue that commitment is increased for all the extra investment the person has placed in the relationship. And actually they feel locked into this connection now because ending the relationship would mean sacrificing all those resources they've invested into that relationship. So what can we say on evaluative research? Well, I'm gonna go back to Rusbutt's longitudinal study because in this study, 17 males, 17 female participants were given questionnaires about the development of their relationship. And of course, it included costs, rewards, investments, and comparison with alternatives. And what did Rosbert find? Rosbert found that as relationships developed over time, investment size would increase, and that resulted in greater commitment. It also resulted in a reduction of how they felt about the alternatives around them. So increased investment meant they just didn't look at these other people around them as potential alternative partners. So this does suggest that commitment is linked to the amount of investment that's put into a relationship, and it will ultimately influence a stay-leave decision. Of course, we can use the evaluative extension to say that this activity on dating couples has got quite low validity. If you're asking partners to intensively rate their relationship on a regular basis, that isn't really what people do explicitly. They might do it unconsciously, but they very rarely write these things down. Also with this study, it might like generalization because it was done in American students. And self-report questionnaires have inherently got a response bias aspect to it. We might also criticize it because it's correlational. So lots of options with Rusbert. 
an extra piece of evaluative work more recently by Rattigan and Axum. Use the investment model scale, which measured commitment, investment alternatives and satisfaction on women who had suffered intimate partner violence, so their partners had been abusive to them. And Rattigan and Oxum's findings did support the investment model. The women with the highest commitment to maintaining these abusive relationships were those women that had made the most investments in the relationship. But this is just looking at women inside abusive relationships. These findings might not be generalizable to women outside abusive relationships, although they do explain the continuation of relationships that the usual models of equity theory and social exchange just wouldn't be able to explain. So how might we build these evaluations up? Well, it's very likely that investment cost is a concept that will apply across cultures. People do similar things to invest, such as have children, buy homes, and build up social networks as a couple. But there might be some differing considerations about what is an investment. For example, people in Western societies might view giving up their own time as more of an investment. And people in collectivist societies might feel that like building a strong family connection is a larger investment. So investment theory is a flexible concept. And some research by Lee and Agno did show in a very large meta-analysis that the model will apply in at least five countries and the study also included homosexual couples. Another issue we've mentioned, the correlational method that's used in most of these theories is a problem. Of course, there isn't much option but to use correlational research because you can't place people into a relationship on an experimental method. What it could mean though, is high investment is the result of high commitment. It's not the other way around. It might be that high investment is the result of a high commitment. You might feel strongly committed to an individual, so you decide to put more of your time, money, and risk more in the relationship. Not that high investment results in the high commitment. Linked on to the Rattigan and Axum study, the Rosbrot investment model really can explain a lot of relationships that social exchange theory and equity theory really can't. I mentioned this could be why abused partners with really low profits might maintain a relationship. But it also explains how actually a quite satisfying, enjoyable relationship might just end because an attractive partner appears and there's been low investments in the relationship. That being said, many relationships in their early stages have rocky patches. There might be cheating, there might be arguments, and quite a lot of these relationships survive that phase. The investment model simply doesn't explain this. At early stages in relationships, very little is invested. There are no children, there are few mutual friends, and usually people aren't living together. And a final criticism, most of these studies also use self-report. Of course this is necessary because it's not possible to set up a controlled experiment where you randomly assign people into relationships. But the use of self-report can be criticised as potentially having low validity due to response bias. I really hope you found this video useful in studying psychology. Three things help this channel grow a lot. Likes, comments and subscriptions. Thank you so much if you've done any of those things for this video.